So we are in the season of Lent, the time leading up to Easter. Hard to believe that Palm Sunday is next Sunday already. Uh, But during Lent, we've been going through our series called Led. Uh, There were moments in Jesus' ministry where the Holy Spirit played a prominent role in his teaching and ministry. Uh, Jesus was Spirit-led, which is one of our directives here at TFRC, where we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in everything. Uh, In this series, we want to equip ourselves to better identify how the Spirit is leading us. And as we learn what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit and see how Jesus relies on the Holy Spirit in his ministry, we want to apply that to discover the Spirit's leading in our lives. The series is titled Led because the Spirit leads us, but the Spirit also acts as a guiding light, like LED lighting. Um, The Spirit lit the way for Jesus in his ministry, and the Spirit lights the way to lead us. So we are looking at Jesus' ministry in the Gospels, focusing on passages where the Holy Spirit is explicitly stated in having a role in the ministry and teaching of Jesus. We've looked at Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit in John 16. We saw how the Spirit was active in both the baptism and temptations of Jesus, saw the Holy Spirit empower Jesus to fulfill the messianic expectations in Isaiah. Uh, The scripture for this morning is Matthew 12, verses 22 to 32. You can turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Uh, You can also look up Matthew 12 on your phones. In this passage, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man, and the Pharisees have a very cynical reaction to it. Our scripture reader for this morning is Ron Griff, and so Ron, go ahead and make your way on to the podium, and as he does, I'm going to ask if you're able, please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, We read from the center to remind us that scriptures be central in our lives, and we stand because we believe that this is the Word of God. And so, uh, Ron, whenever you're ready, please read Matthew 12, verses 22 to 32. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So when, so then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Ron, thank you very much. You may be seated. Up through the seventh grade, I went to Catholic school, and there were about like 25 kids in my class, and it was in the seventh uh, grade that our school got a new seventh grade teacher. She didn't know uh, any of us in our class. She was completely new to the school. Now, my friend Todd and I thought it would be funny to play a trick on the new teacher. And I always hesitate to tell stories like this because there may be students who will be like, well, if the pastor did it, it would be okay for us to do that. That is not true. Um, So I don't necessarily condone this kind of behavior, but this is what we did. My friend Todd and I decided that we would switch names on the teacher. So we told the teacher that my name was Todd. And we told the teacher that Todd's name was Chuck. And we did convince all of our classmates to go along with this. So for like well into the first week of school, the new teacher called me Todd 
and called Todd Chuck. And it was hilarious until, you know, I, I started to feel guilty. Well, and I also realized that sooner or later we're going to get caught. But I first started to feel guilty because the teacher, you know, as we got to know her, she seemed really nice. And what we were doing was not nice. And each passing day, my guilt grew until it really wasn't fun anymore. And so after about a week, I just couldn't do it anymore. And so I told the teacher the truth. And needless to say, the teacher wasn't very happy with us. I don't remember what the punishment was, but it wasn't good. And we definitely got off on the wrong foot with a new teacher. We literally weren't who she thought we were, which is sort of what this story is all about. The, Ser the Pharisees were convinced they knew who Jesus was. And they just couldn't have been more wrong. The passage begins with an act of power. Going back to verse 22, where it says, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? And just a few details to walk through here first. Um, first of all, the demon-possessed man didn't demonstrate, you know, what we would expect a demon-possessed person to be like. You know, typically when we envision someone demon-possessed, we think of someone like the man possessed by a legion of demons, you know, wandering in the tombs, acting out of his mind, cutting himself, those kinds of things. Well, this man didn't have any of those symptoms. He was blind and mute. Those were the symptoms. Yet the root of his problem was that he was demon-possessed. And part of Jesus' healing was casting the demon out. Now, another detail to highlight is that this man was both blind and mute. And this is the only time in the whole Bible where there is someone who is both blind and mute and is healed. It was an amazing healing because Jesus restored both sight and speech at the same time. It was an act of power. And sometimes we just need to see acts of power. And acts of power, well, they're kind of common in the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, the greatest ensemble of acts of power are seen in the Exodus story where God's people are slaves in Egypt and God wants Pharaoh to let his people go. And so God is going to use acts of power to convince Pharaoh to do it. As it says in Exodus 3, but I know, God says, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Again, sometimes we need to see acts of power. And so Jesus restores this man's sight and speech. And the people are amazed at his act of power. And they ask themselves, could this be the son of David? They are wondering if Jesus could be the Messiah. Jesus was clearly not the conquering and ruling Messiah they were expecting. However, this healing was an act of power, the kind of power they expected the Messiah to have. And so the best way to understand their question, could this be the son of David, would be with sort of a doubtful tilt to it. This guy couldn't be the Messiah, could he? You know, it was, it was doubtful for them. However, <laughs> He just healed a blind and mute man. So they just weren't sure what to make of Jesus. It just made them wonder. So Jesus performs this act of power, and it's followed by this incredible accusation from the Pharisees. Um, going back to verse 24, where it says, But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, 
By whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. So the Pharisees say that it's by the prince of demons that Jesus drives out demons. This is, in essence, a charge of sorcery. And sorcery was punishable by death. Now, Beelzebul is a name that comes from the god Baal in the Old Testament. And there's different ways of spelling it. And depending on how you spell it, it kind of changes the meaning. And so Beelzebul, that ends in an L, can mean Lord of the Heights or Lord of the House. And I just want you to make note of that Lord of the House meaning. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But Beelzebul is the name of a senior demon. And in this passage, it seems like Jesus uses Beelzebul and Satan as names for the same demon. But here is the problem the Pharisees have. One, they cannot deny what they just, everyone just saw. They cannot deny the power of Jesus in the miracle. Yet, they do not want to admit that Jesus is from God. And so the Pharisees assume the worst about Jesus and accuse him of using the power of demons to drive out demons, which is both a serious and a silly charge. It's a serious charge because the penalty of sorcery is death, but it's a silly charge because it's nonsense, which Jesus immediately refutes with simple logic. You see, Satan has a kingdom that's in opposition to God. There's a battle between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And the demon possession of that man is a manifestation of Satan's kingdom. And so if Satan drives out Satan, his kingdom is divided. And if Satan's kingdom is divided, it cannot stand. A divided kingdom, it cannot stand. That was Abraham Lincoln's point <laughs> during the Civil War. A divided kingdom cannot stand. That's true for all kingdoms, whether it's an earthly kingdom or a spiritual kingdom. The logic of the Pharisees is absurd. And then Jesus points out that the Pharisees have seen demons cast out before. He asks them, well, by whom do you, your people cast them out? And the implication is that those associated with the Pharisees drive out demons by the power of God. And so if they drive out demons by the power of God, why is it so hard for them to believe that Jesus drives out demons by the power of God? Why is Jesus's ministry under this kind of scrutiny? The whole accusation is a farce and it just doesn't make sense. No one else is assumed to cast out demons by the power of Satan. So even after a great act of power, the Pharisees didn't want to admit that Jesus came from God. And not wanting to admit God's power when you see it is nothing new. It's happened before in the Bible many times when God acts in a powerful way. Revisiting the Exodus story. The first plague of that story is the Nile turning to blood. Moses' staff strikes the Nile, the Nile turns to blood, blood is everywhere in Egypt, and here is Pharaoh's response in Exodus 7. The Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not even take this to heart. So God turns the water into blood. Pharaoh didn't want to believe that the God of Moses was any different from any of his gods. And so he looks for a reason to not believe it. And the Egyptian magicians give him the reason. They copy the act of power. And so Pharaoh does not take the act of God to heart. And now here in our story, Jesus heals a man who is blind and mute. And the Pharisees didn't want to believe it. So they come up with a reason to not believe it. They attribute the miracle to Satan. And they don't take Jesus' miracle to heart. And what the Pharisees did was even worse because Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit for the miracle. So the Pharisees give credit to Satan for something the Holy Spirit does. And so going back to the passage in verse 31 where it says, 
So I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, these two verses garner a lot of attention (laughs) because they mention the unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And many believers, many followers of Jesus have wondered what this is, and they've wondered, am I guilty of this? Because the unforgivable sin is by definition, you know, and here's a gem that you're going to get from me, an unforgivable sin by definition is unforgivable. So the idea of committing the unforgivable is terrifying. So what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, it is deliberately refusing to acknowledge God's power, intentionally attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. Because when you do that, you undercut the possibility of experiencing the reality of God's salvation. It is a hardened heart issue. Now, here is what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not. It is not questioning whether something is from the Holy Spirit or not. Because remember what Scripture says in 1 John. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see if they are from God. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is going against plain and obvious evidence. And the Holy Spirit's work in the ministry of Jesus was unique. It was plain and obvious. And while he acts in our lives, it's not always plain and obvious as it was in the ministry of Jesus. We must use discernment. Now, if you would like one way to know that you haven't committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, here's how you know. If you are honestly worried about committing it, you haven't committed it. And here's why. In order to commit this sin, you have to have a hardened heart. And because of the hardness of your heart, if you had the hardness of heart to commit this sin, you would not care whether or not you've committed it. So the fact that you care shows that your heart isn't in that place. Look, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not an error in judgment. It's a result of a hard and unrepentant heart. It's when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God acted, and then you turn around and you come up with any excuse to not believe it, and you're even willing to say, oh, that must have been Satan. It's the kind of heart that calls good things evil, and evil things good. Which is exactly what the Pharisees did. They called an obvious act of the Holy Spirit evil. So, what the Pharisees really miss with their accusation is the arrival of the kingdom of God. Going to verses 28 and 29 of the passage, where it says, But if it is by the Spirit of God, that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Look, Israel at this time was under Roman occupation, but Jesus did not see the Roman Empire as the enemy kingdom. Jesus saw Satan's kingdom as the enemy kingdom. There's a battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus came to show that the kingdom of Satan has lost. I said earlier, take note of one of the meanings of Beelzebul. It can mean Lord of the house. And what does Jesus say? How can anyone enter the strong man's house 
unless he first ties up the strong man. Beelzebul is the Lord of the house. He's the strong man. Jesus is telling us that by healing the blind and mute man, by casting out the demon which possessed him, that Jesus is plundering the house. The house of Beelzebul, the house of Satan. In order to do that, Satan must be bound. This miracle is Jesus declaring, Satan has lost. I have tied up the strong man. And now this is where the Spirit of God comes in. Because it's by the Spirit that Jesus drives out demons. And if Jesus drives out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come. The Spirit of God brings the kingdom of God. The ministry of Jesus through the Spirit is a turning point in history. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, it sure seems like the kingdom of Satan is alive and well. I get that. The kingdom of Satan is alive. The kingdom of Satan is not well. It has lost. And it knows it has lost. And like every earthly kingdom that realizes it has lost the war, the spiritual kingdom of Satan is trying to do as much damage as it can before it is gone. Because they know they've lost. Satan isn't more active because he is stronger. He is more active because he knows that his days are numbered. And he's doing as much damage as he can with the time he has left. He has lost. Now, going back to the kingdom of God. There is a parallel passage to this story in the Gospel of Luke. And here is what Luke says when Jesus talks about driving out demons. He says in Luke 11, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God and the Spirit of God are referring to the same concept, God bringing the kingdom. And while the term Spirit of God can be found in lots of places in the Bible, the phrase finger of God only occurs four times in the whole Bible. And only one time in the New Testament. You are looking at it. Now, the first time it appears in the Old Testament, the term finger of God, is in the Exodus story. During the third plague, the plague of gnats. The plague of blood was the first plague. It was followed by the plague of frogs. And now you have the plague of gnats. And after the plague of gnats, here's what happens. Exodus 8. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. So by the third plague, the Egyptian magicians knew that Moses' God was different. It was God's act of power. And likewise, Jesus acts with the power of the finger of God. And the Pharisees do not acknowledge what the Egyptian magicians did. And Jesus says the finger of God, the spirit of God brings the kingdom of God. And so what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? Someone once gave me a nice three-point outline on what it means for the kingdom of God to come. I'm just going to share that with you. The kingdom of God first comes with an act of power, again, called the finger of God. And whether it was something like the ten plagues, or Jesus' healings, or Jesus casting out demons, the Spirit of God acts in power, and the Spirit of God still acts in power in our lives, driving away the power of the evil one. And then the second thing is, it needs to be recognized. We need to recognize that the Lord is God. This is what both Pharaoh and the Pharisees failed to do. The acts of God in their lives 
were a lot easier to see than the acts of God in our lives. But yet, God does still act in our lives. And we can either choose to acknowledge Jesus acting through the Spirit in us or not. And sometimes, look, we honestly miss it. But sometimes we see it, and we come up with a reason not to believe it. So God acts. We need to recognize it. And then we need to obey. Obey the Lord. Now, here's another gem for you. Declaring Jesus as Lord means Jesus is Lord. The Lord is the one in charge. That's what Lord means. So we are called to submit to him. As Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And the phrase finger of God, I already said occurs four times in the Bible. You've seen it once in Luke. You've seen it once in Exodus. The other two times refer to the same event. And so I will just share one of those with you in Deuteronomy 9, where it says, the Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. The finger of God is God acting in power and it's the finger of God that writes the commandments of the Lord. Remember, the Lord is the one in charge. The king is the one whose will is done in his kingdom. And so if the Spirit brings the kingdom of God, then what God commands is to be obeyed in the kingdom of God. It's kind of the definition of a kingdom, the place where one rules. And our passage of the day, I ended it at 1232, but if you were to read 1233 to 37, you will notice that the very next thing Jesus talks about is a tree and its fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. That whole thing is about obedience. So after working a miracle in the power of the Spirit and explaining that that needs to be recognized, that it's the Spirit that gives him his power, he then goes on to talk about obedience in terms of good fruit. The kingdom of God, acts of power, recognition, and obedience. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. That actually happened, and it changes everything. And the Spirit continues to usher in the kingdom of God. The Spirit continues to act in power in our lives. May God give us the eyes to see it. And may we soften our hearts to acknowledge it. And then when we recognize Jesus as Lord... May we have the humility to bend our knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So come, Lord Jesus, and through your spirit, bring your kingdom to us. Please pray with me. And Lord, that is our prayer. That as your spirit comes, bringing your kingdom that we would see it, that we would acknowledge it. And Lord, through that, that we would bend our knee in obedience to your kingdom. So Lord, we do thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we declare to you now that you are our Savior and Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And receive God's blessing. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.